Hi, welcome. We're going to do a bit of a lazy solve of medium rares HHV challenge six. Uh, this was a challenge that rare put together for Hackfest 2020. You can see the challenge description and binary are, are linked there from the DC HHV org site. Uh, Hackfest 2020 happened back in November and rare added this challenge at that time to his sequence of other HHV challenges. If you want to play along uh, with the video, I suggest you go and download this binary, hit pause, and come back when it's downloaded. You can see the challenge description here. But all that to say that what we have is an AT Mega, the binary from it. Uh, we know that AT Mega is connected to a seven segment display through some kind of map. We don't know. If we can figure out what that mapping is, Presumably, we can read out the flag as it scrolls by on the seven segment display. That's the approach we're going to take. Most of the presentation is going to happen here in the terminal. You'll find that uh, when I type things, there's a little display of my keyboard typing happening so you can learn what the shortcut keys are that I'm going to use uh, when I'm using things like Radar. Um, Maybe install the tools, follow along. Let's get started. So let's start by using Radar 2 to uh, disassemble that AT Mega firmware. We can open up the firmware using the iHex plugin, which lets Radar parse directly hex files without any conversions or intermediate files we have to produce. And we're going to open that up with automatic analysis. So that's dash capital A, which is the same as typing AAA inside Radar. Um, and then let's do a disassembly of the current function once we have it open. OK. So when we try to do that disassembly, there's a lot of these code xref comments that scroll the material off the bottom. Um, so right off the bat, we're going to want to page around. If you if you have a terminal multiplexer like I do, you can page using that. If you don't, um, Radar has a built-in pager, which you can access with tilde dot dot like this. And we can see what the entry point of this binary is doing. So why don't we ask Radar about some things that it, it knows about this hex file. Uh, e is for accessing all of the Radar 2 configuration variables. Uh, e question question tells us what it's talking about. So let's have a look at that. E prints a whole bunch of stuff. Um, we could obviously page through that using the built-in pager. There's a lot of different configuration variables. Some of the names are pretty descriptive. Uh, if we want to know more information about that, we can use e question question. And you can see the descriptions that are built in by the developers then become accessible to us. And because this is a pager, we could also search through it, and see various CPU settings. So um, there's obviously config variables that are set up by Radar uh, that are about CPU we can grep through the output using tilde by itself, which is the internal grep operator. And you can grep through all those configuration variables for CPU. And we can see that magically, Radar knew that the binary we handed it in that hex file format comes from an AVR architecture, an AT Mega 8. What else does it know about this binary? Well, I is for um, information about the container. When you're in doubt about a command in Radar, you can always throw a question mark on the end of the command, and it'll print the help. So page, in this case, I gets info from the open file, as it tells us. Uh, we're going to do I all by itself, which tells us some things. Format is AVR. There we go. 
It knew. Somehow it knew. We don't need to know how. We just need to solve the challenge. So what about trying to browse around and figure stuff out? radar has got some stuff for that. Uh, we can use V for visual mode, which by default opens up a rather nice hex dump. Uh, you can actually use P to switch the printing mode. Uh, if you hit P once, then you're brought immediately to a disassembly. You can see here some of the disassembly and the entry point, which looks just like our PDF that we printed out. Um, when you're doing disassembly in visual mode, Radar lets you look at flow graphs by hitting space. So here we are. You can see the nice extended basic blocks linking to each other. When you are looking at these uh, these graphs, you can actually navigate through calls to other functions. So we can see here there is a call to function 4e, and there's this little markup of the square OA. When you see those, you can actually type OA or whatever, and it navigates the function. Here's another call, also marked by OA, which we can follow with OA. Uh, and we can go back using U to undo that seek. That's a nice way to navigate through the binary. The uh, In other display modes, like when you're not in the graph display, you might see markup of numerals, and you can actually navigate that way with the square bracket and then the number. But U also works in that case. This is a pretty good way to navigate around the binary. And why do we want to navigate? Because we want to understand that binary. Now, maybe you don't know AVR assembly. That's OK. Um, I don't really know it that well either. We can actually switch the disassembly mode uh, and print pseudo disassembly, which is sometimes easier to read. So you can see I dropped into uh, command mode while we are in visual mode by hitting colon. And then we turn on the ASM true and hit enter again. And now, instead of looking at ADR disassembly, we're looking at a pseudocode. So R1 is getting XORed back in R1. Uh, R28 takes the value of 5F. Go to's instead of calls. So in a lot of cases, uh, for a lot of people, this might be easier to follow. We follow to 4E. We follow to 3, 4, and so on. So feel free to look at this in pseudo assembly mode if you like. All right. So where are we? We're in function hex 34. And what is it doing? OK, so 34 which is, remember, being called by 4E. So we can go back. 4E and immediately calls hex 34. And hex 34 is rather short. It is setting up values into the port A pins pull-ups location. reads the value from the pins pull-ups, applies a mask of E1, writes it out, uh, and then it reads the data direction for port A, ORs a mask, writes it back out. Same for B. So this routine is pretty obviously doing some setup stuff of the um, input and output directions of the GPIO pins on the AVR. particular, the data direction registers are getting assigned, are getting turned on, getting the bits um, 1E turned on for data direction A, 
and the bits of 7 turned on for data direction B. Right? Like we said, almost certainly output input configuration. And we know that 1E and 07 were the two byte values being put into those uh, configuration registers. So what if we wanted to look at a value in binary? Uh, Radar has a whole bunch of printing functions that are prefixed by question mark. So this is different than putting question mark at the end of a command. This is the first character question mark. Um, you can print hexadecimal with dollar or question mark V. We can print in binary with question mark B. So if those were in fact um, configuration input output pins for GPIOs, then there would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them for a seven segment display. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a pretty reasonable sanity check. It makes us think that we probably did find the configuration registers. But most importantly, what values are being put out onto those pins? So let's go back to 4E. Um, the command you see there is pretty good to remember. When you want to go back, uh, the equivalent of that U command that we did in visual mode, you do S minus, kind of like CD minus on the command line. Uh, and remember, PDF is for printing a disassembly of the current function, which will probably run off the bottom of your terminal. So remember the internal pager. It is your friend. So at the beginning here, a whole bunch of these registers are getting load up, loaded up with different constants. R20 through R26. And then we have um, IO operations, writing the value of a register to 1B and 1.8, which occurs again. And then occurs again. So there's these repeated writes to 1B and 1.8x from various different registers. You can see it's R20 in one case, R23 in the next, R21 in the next, and these different registers were loaded up with different constants. And these locations, 1B and 1A, are actually recognized by Radar as the, uh, the port A and port B output pin configurations. So presumably when we write these values out, these are going to have an impact on the GPIO output pin state. Um, and in between the outs are loops. You can see here that R29 is getting loaded up with a particular value. So is uh, R28 getting a subtraction. Ah, yes, that's right. So AVR does this thing where they actually combine two registers together for extended words. Um, and then it's doing a subtraction. So it's doing a countdown of a loop here. And only uh, is it going to exit that loop when uh, the counter runs out. So you have setting values on output on the GPIOs followed by busy wait delay loops. This function here is almost certainly the function that's um, driving those. Go back to our diagram. That's the function that's driving the outputs of these seven pins, which are somehow mapped to the segments. What we want is to figure out what is the sequence of those outputs. And then eventually we can remap the outputs um, to some kind of correct mapping onto the seven segments and then be able to read the text that's scrolling by on the seven segments. So we can see here there's lots of different outs in this function. Um, I go on and on. So 
it's writing out some kind of a long string, probably a flag. Remember that in Raid Air, we have this internal grep operator with tilde, and we can actually grep for things like out. So in this case, we just grepped for all of the disassembly lines that match the string out um, in this function. We can even use the internal grep to uh, just show particular columns. So the when you add that square operator, you can filter just a column out. Uh, we can see that the sequence of registers that are being written to the locations is something we have access to with six. Um, and if we were to do 526, we could even see what location gets which register. So we're very close to having that output sequence of values. Uh, Radar includes the ability to emulate different architectures. It uses um, an, an internal intermediate language called ESIL uh, to do this. So if we were to look at this function, the first thing it does is um, calls function 34, which, as you recall, sets up a whole bunch of different states. And we don't need to follow that setup because we're not actually driving the pins. We're just interested in the output. And calling that function would require us to set up the stack and have a return address. But we don't want that hassle. So let's just start from the next address after the call. The emulation module in Rainier can be initialized with AEI, uh, and then we can set the emulations program counter, the instruction pointer, uh, to the current seek with AEIP. We know that there are out operations, uh, and these are IO operations. They should be changing values in IO space. When you are expecting changes in the mappings, you want to tell Radar to allow that by setting the IO cache to true. Uh, and then once we've done this, we can actually single step the code uh, in visual mode. So we've already done P previously to get into this state, uh, which is the disassembly. We're going to do P one more to get the nice register output. Uh, and then as we hit S for single step, you can actually see that there's an effect. So we just single stepped over R20, and it now has the value of E. Single stepping is possible. Now, of course, once we're on the out instruction, there is going to be a small problem. So AVR and ESIL does have a problem with out instructions. Um, when we single step over that out, we're going to find that the, uh, the values in memory, even though we've set IO cache to true, are not going to be tracked. So you can see here a session where we're doing a step until there's an IO instruction uh, changing the seek the current location of rate error to the program counter, the instruction pointer of the SIL. Uh, and here we're doing a disassembly. So this is a different kind of disassembly function, PID instead of PDF. Roughly the same thing, but it removes all the, ca the comments. And then we can analyze some of the instructions. So let's, let's do a few of those steps. Okay, so back to 50, AI, AIP. We already set the cache. Let's step until there's an IO operation and seek to the location. If we were to just print one instruction, we can see that we're on out of R20 to hex 1B. Uh, AO is analyzing opcodes and kind of lets you print what Radar knows about the particular opcode. So let's ask it what it knows about this one instruction uh, quite a lot. 
its address, how it's actually disassembled, the pseudo form, the ESIL form, uh, and the family. So in its ESIL representation, Radar actually knows the source of the operation, the fact that it's going to I.O., uh, what address of I.O. it's going to. This is obviously 1B hex, and that it's getting stored. So Radar is able to parse that information out. Um, and of course, the current value of a register can be queried using AR. So we can get the value. It's E. I think you remember at the setup of the function, that's the first one that got assigned. So there's that value. We can actually look at memory. Uh, so P8 is a way of printing 8-bit hex pair strings. We can print four of them at the I.O. location. That's the current value. And if we are to do one step, that's a ESAL step. If it worked, we would actually see the change, which we don't. So there is a rub here that um, ESAL isn't able to emulate those out instructions. So we can't just watch memory and uh, look at the changes by just watching 1B and 1.8 uh, hex in memory. But we're not defeated. We just need to do it the harder way. Remember that uh, that AO of that single instruction did include a lot of information, uh, including the ESAL representation, which obviously has the source and the destination in it. Uh, and we can also query the value of the registers. So if we could just script this up, we could extract it. And there is such a facility for this. It's called R2Pipe. Uh, R2Pipe has a whole bunch of different bind language bindings for controlling Radar 2 programmatically and we're going to use Python. So that Python script um, looks kind of like something that's driving Radar from, you know, Python. You're embedding the Radar commands uh, into our command calls and using the results in some case to uh, store values, and then we can use the constructs we're familiar with in the language. So you'll recognize this setup of, uh, of ESIL here. Remember, dash A is the same as AA for analysis. Uh, here we're turning off a few of the um, extra syntax sugar that would show up in our prints down here. Uh, and in this case, we're using a JSON variant of command. This is pretty powerful because if we use a radar command that uses JSON output inside the command J form, what we get out is a structure, you know, a, a dict in Python. And then we're able to, to query that structure without um, trying to parse strings, which we will later do because some of the fields do need some of that string parsing. We did mention the uh, question mark V for printing hexadecimals, and the double dollar sign is the current address. So you can see how that would work right here, the hexadecimal of the current seek. Uh, PDJ is print disassembly in JSON form. And then what we've done here is grab that ESIL representation. Um, in fact, PDJ1 is the same as the AO form that we just talked about. They're both available. That's what we're doing there. We grab the SAL, we split it up, and then we can grab the source register, the target address, uh, and then through another command by querying the registers, we can query the value of the source register to have on hand. And then as we're looping through, we're single stepping uh, until we hit an IO family instruction and changing radar seek to the instruction pointer of the emulator. When we find uh, an IO instruction that's pointing at hex 18, we're going to print out a CSV of the pin state. Uh, otherwise, we're going to just augment our pin state with the things that are pointing at 1B. We do this because uh, 
the pattern in the disassembly was to print uh, was to write to hex 1b and then write to hex 18. So we'll, in this case, we'll pull e, the first value assigned, uh, into the lower half of our output pin state. And then r25 takes that value of 1. We'll put that into the upper half of our pin state and print. Uh, and then the script will continue to run down the code until it hits this out instruction, and it'll store the value of R23 at that point in the lower half, store the value of R19 in the upper half, and then print the row. And the uh, the CSV printing that I've kind of elided with these comments uh, is nothing special. It's just printing a header here and then printing the bit values of the, uh, the output pin state registers on each occurrence. So we're going to leave right error and we're going to run that script instead. And you can see it in action. What you're looking at here is, as we discussed, um, E and 1 and so on. And in fact, uh, we can now move to using Cygrock to inspect this pin state, treating it just like a logic analyzer capture. Okay, so it works just like we screen crap down below. So what you're looking at here is a, an ASCII art rendering of the pin states uh, that we just put together. Uh, you're seeing here the very first column. Those three together make E, and that makes one. So the columns here of the CSV are actually printed as rows. If you're more familiar with... Um, you know, normal logic analyzers or pulse view, uh, you might see it looking like this. So this is the same, the same thing, the same CSV, but in the pulse view, graphical version of the logic analyzer. We're going to stay in the terminal though. And that is because um, we can do some more powerful stuff in the terminal and build on top of that. So if you remember the bit mask, uh, that was set for the output pins, a 1E07 that actually has bits, 3, 4, etc. set. So we can specify that as a, a pin mask to Cygrock. So we're just looking at the channels we're interested in. And then we can actually plot that output as renderings of a seven segment uh, display. So to finish this challenge, we actually did patch libcygrock to extend the decoding that's possible on seven segments, segment segment displays. The alphabet was um, kind of limited before and rare used all kinds of uh, cute lettering choices to encode the flag, so we needed to actually expand all of the alphabet that's available. I'm having a really hard time moving this window onto the monitor that you're looking at. Let me try one more time. There we go. So we had to add things like quotation marks, um, equal signs, different casings of uh, letters, uh, dashes, and obviously underscores, because this is a CTF. So the flags are probably going to have underscores. And that commit was, uh, was accepted as a PR, and it's in there. And for fun, um, we did include a unit test. And this challenge is actually now committed to um, Cygrock test uh, as the mystery message. 
that's present there in GitHub now under Cygrock. So we can actually make use of that by asking for the seven segment decoder of Cygrock. And we're going to use the show unknown equals yes. Uh, remember, we don't know what the mapping is. So unless rare set up this mapping to match exactly the defaults that we found in that pin state mask, which he didn't because this is a CTF challenge, um, we're not going to get the flag right away. So some of the letters are going to be nonsensical. All right. So in the cases where it just isn't a letter that's available in the expanded alphabet we just showed you, uh, it'll show that hash. So in this case, with the default mapping, it doesn't look very flag-like. And we're going to have to do some searching. So in recap, where we're at, uh, we reversed, uh, air quotes, the binary in that AT mega. Uh, we know which pins are relevant. We even know what their values are and how they change over time. But we don't know how those pins map to the segments of a seven segment display. We don't know how to make that part happen. And then because we have that decoder, if we knew this map, uh, the decoder could show us a printable representation of that pretty quickly. So we need to figure out that mapping. Um, and of course, brute forcing it is possible. So, you know, that previous command that you saw, you can pretty easily put that into a, a shell script. So I'll copy out the version that I developed previously. You know, it's not a big surprise. We're just showing the pins that we're limited to. We're using that ASCII output. We're using the same decoder and including show unknown yes. Whatever argument we give it needs to be the pin map. And then we use some awk, uh, you know, stuff to squish it all together into one row output. So let's try this uh, default map. And uh, no joy, as you saw before, the default mapping doesn't work. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to, you know, use Python or any other language to, to put together a permutation of all the possible pin maps. I'll pull that in here. And I'm pretty sure there's a better way to do this, but this is the way I did it. And this will create a file that will contain all possible maps for the seven segment display that we're interested in with the form of A equals number through G equals number. So now we, we have that file of all the maps. And of course, you know, lazy brute force, we can just pipe that uh, read each line into a variable and uh, run that attempt map for each line that we read and uh, hope for the best. And it's running pretty decent. You know, we're getting some good output. Um, definitely a fun scroll to watch. But if we started getting bored of watching the scroll and just started grepping for flag, we would find that we would be waiting quite a while. It's not very fast. Uh, takes about an hour using this approach, at least on my setup. Using GNU Parallel is pretty attractive here because the problem is trivially parallelizable. Right? There's no data interdependence here. Um, the next problem that you'll run into using GNU Parallel, at least I did, is because of my VM, the whole thing was uh, IO bound. Oh, actually, that turned out way faster this time. Don't look at that. So let's use uh, GNU Parallel to get this done. So we're going to go to that RAM disk and spin it up. Now, once again, using that attempt map, once again, grepping for flag. And in this case, it should happen in less than a minute.
course, in live demos. Nothing ever goes as planned. So there it is. Flag k shift into reverse. Of course, the um, that translation process of going from ASCII to seven segment to ASCII is lossy. Uh, and Rare also forgot the closing bracket. So shoehorning that a bit in the format, uh, the flag is actually flag shift into reverse with threes for two of the three E's in reverse. And that is the lazy solve. So many thanks to iHack, uh, QuebecSec, HackFest, and Medium Rare for putting this fun challenge together. Uh, I had fun banging away on this during HackFest, and uh, I enjoy all of Rare's challenges. I encourage you to try them out. They're still up there. I know Rare is also going to be doing a talk here at the HHV this year for walkthroughs of his challenges. I know there's going to be more new ones this year. Both he and I will be hanging out in Discord and available for questions should you have any. Thanks very much. Have a good con.